Good day, everyone. Um, my name is Natalia Tatsovichkovska, and let me open the event. We will be talking today about rebuilding Ukrainian economy together with Minister of Finance of Ukraine, Sergei Marchenko. Uh, this event organized by here Eurasia Center, and thank you, Atlantic Council, for discussing such an important issue for Ukraine now. This event would be moderated by uh, John Liske. Uh, so, first of all, um, as we are today in Davos, and maybe this is the, uh, the best place to talk about economy and talk about it now, as we are now going through unprecedented challenge. It's an active phase of Russia invasion into Ukraine, uh, that we are now witnessing unprecedented challenge. First of all, this is new type of hybrid war, which include not only uh, physical war, but also uh, global uh, humanitarian crisis we have since uh, war, war II. We have more than 10 million displaced, internally displaced people in Ukraine, as well as almost 5 million abroad. This is also connected to energy crisis, uh, to artificial food crisis. We also experience cyber attacks and other consequences. As it's not possible to eliminate uh, uh, the war in uh, globalized war, world in, in the frame of one country. So this war would have a far-reaching consequences, not on economic consequences, not only in Ukraine, but uh, to the rest of the world. So at the moment, when we are talking about uh, Ukraine, so according to different calculation, uh, the uh, direct and indirect uh, uh, economical losses, now they reach almost uh, $600 billion. So a large, huge damage to the social infrastructure uh, and uh, to the economy. Uh, but we also, as I said, uh, have not only economic, but also humanitarian crisis. And uh, we also need to deal with uh, multi-task and multi-challenges at the same time. Uh, so uh, first of all, to deal with uh, displaced people who lost the job, who stay still in Ukraine, and it, it, it's a huge challenge. Second, we also experience a uh, uh, global food crisis, which is also due to because everything in uh, coming months. So energy shock as well. So uh, you know now uh, uh, all the countries are trying to avoid Russian gas and oil. Uh, so a lot of countries all already imposed embargo. So uh, the energy system is also under big pressure. All countries need to redesign uh, gas flows and uh, rethink the energy system and energy security. So why we are thinking about the Ukrainian economy now when the wild stage of war is uh, going on? First of all, it's important to have a short-term, uh, middle-term, and long-term vision. How the economy will be, first of all, handled at this moment, and secondly, how it would be rebuilt about the, uh, when the war will end. And I truly believe in Ukrainian victory, and this time will come sooner than later. First of all, uh, if you are talking about uh, uh, far-reaching plans, long-term perspective, we need to give these people who are fighting in the front, we need to give them vision. Uh, what would be Ukraine after war ended? It could be good, it could be different scenario, and uh, it's in our hands uh, to design and redesign economy from the scratch. So the big idea is to create new type of economy, to rebuild Ukraine in sustainable way, to redesign old-fashioned energy system and turn to uh, a more greener, cleaner uh, and more sustainable uh, energy system inside Ukraine to secure, to expand infrastructure and also to make it much more efficient. So first of all, uh, uh, our vision is to make it much more efficient, much more productive and uh, greener. In middle term perspective, we also need to think about uh, all the displaced people who lose their job, how they will be uh, employed, how to, find, uh, to help them to find uh, uh, their working place inside and outside Ukraine and immediate needs, which is now also huge uh, um, because the economy is going through the very big hardship. Uh, we also need to win this war. We need to stand, uh, stand strong. And for this, it also needs a support and somehow uh, thinking and vision how to make this economy running. At this point, I'll turn, uh, uh, I'll give the floor to Minister of uh, 
financed uh, Serhii Marchenko and uh, to continue on immediate needs, which is quite important, and uh, uh, to uh, continue this discussion. And to Josh Lis Lipsky, uh, who will be moderating this discussion as well. Uh, Natalia, thank you for that very important opening that set the framework for this. And Minister Marchenko, thank you for being with us today. We know how precious your time is, and it's truly appreciated from all of us at the Atlantic Council. I run the Geoeconomic Center on behalf of the Eurasia Center as well. My colleagues, Ambassador John Herbst and Melinda Herring. I want to jump right in. We have a lot of questions to get to. I want the audience to ask questions as well, so please submit in the Q&A function for those of you on the Zoom. But let's start pre-invasion, because it's so easy to overlook this in the current crisis. Could you tell us a little bit about the state of the Ukrainian economy before the invasion from January? Uh, thank you very much. First of all, thank you for inviting me to be, to be with you to talk about uh, our pre-time economic conditions, our wartime economic conditions, and how come we can deal with the post-war period. So uh, let's start from where we was before the war. First and uh, most important thing I want to tell you that uh, um, it should have been 2022 should be a year of success build up of Ukraine. So our basis uh, for this year was very um, strong. And uh, I think that uh, this year is, was very flexible in uh, public finance sphere, in uh, other economic sphere, so we can manage to uh, deal with all challenges. We get accustomed to how to deal with COVID crisis. I think that Ukraine was only one economy in emerging markets economy which uh, can uh, decrease the level of debt to GDP ratio in uh, COVID period. So also uh, this level was uh, only 49%. And uh, uh, our deficit uh, in 2021 was 3.8%. And uh, plan deficit was 5.5. Uh, so we decreased the, the amount of money which we needed to, to borrow uh, very drastically. And again, uh, in 2022, we plan a deficit level like 3.5% of GDP. So it was also very low in comparison with other countries. And uh, despite all the problems, despite all of the challenges, I think this year, should have been uh, different for us. And uh, our international reserves was very huge, 31 billion US dollars. And uh, and it was so in January even, in, in January we uh, had GDP growth more than 7%. So uh, I believe that uh, it will be not so dynamic to in the whole year, but again, we expected the um, level of GDP growth more than 4% for 2022. But uh, it was dreams because now we see that Ukraine is today is a three months of war. And uh, we realize that is we live in a far different country than we expected. Our economic situation is far different. We see the drastic uh, GDP decline we see that uh, our revenue also um, dropped very, very, uh, in very huge amount. For example, we lost 70% of our pre-war revenues from customs. Our uh, revenues from state administrations, uh, we can manage to only 70%. But now our key focus is how to uh, make our government functional, uh, to stay paying pensions, uh, to stay paying salaries, social protections, payments, uh, salaries for healthcare, healthcare workers, uh, educational needs, facilities, etc. So, and we managed to do so despite all the war crisis. If starting from the first days of war, we relocated our critical infrastructure in a very uh, safe place and uh, we managed to provide all 
payments of our treasuries since the first day of war. Our uh, banking system is well functioning as well. So I think that it's something we can uh, be uh, proud of. But again, it's not just we should be proud, it's our people who uh, received the necessary payments and who can uh, get some uh, money to be able to live this very uh, critical condition. So I think it uh, was to finish for this uh, starting points. Let's start from the question and questions and I am ready to answer it. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the, where it's telling us where the Ukrainian economy came from, which helps us measure the extent of what needs to be done. I want to start out where you ended here on the reserves and the payments. We understand that there's probably a five billion deficit monthly. What with you have with what you have in hand right now, can how are you able to sustain current payments going out? What is the gap that needs to be filled in the immediate sense? Um, the gap we had uh, right now, which uh, very closely, uh, uh, which were very closely analyzed by our key partners from IMF and World Bank, is around five billion US dollars per month. Uh, it's uh, figures which uh, very we were all world is stressful. So I think that other countries also believe that uh, this figure is, is right and very correct. Uh, this figures, figure includes all necessary payments which you should pay for our humanitarian and social needs. So it's just gap we should finance except of military one. So for this basis, we uh, provide necessary negotiations with our partners. And now we are trying to fill this uh, uh, Top up this amount with all possible um, partners and donors. What we see right now is that, for example, in May, we haven't uh, got all this amount. Now, for this particular moment, we received only 1.2 billion US dollars in our account. And uh, to the end of the to the to the end of this month, we expected receive uh, up to 2 billion, but not 5. So, and uh, it makes uh, us to do some very uh, drastic decision for our economy. We try to uh, wisely manage our cash liquidity balance. So made some uh, uh, postponement of payments. We do some uh, other steps to prevent uh, De deficit to prevent making uh, um, problems with the payments. But again, uh, we can manage to uh, borrow internally through war bonds. And uh, every month we can borrow up to 1 billion US dollars as a war bonds. Also, uh, at this moment of our history, uh, our central bank, National Bank of Ukraine, is eager to support government and it's uh, uh, totally agreed with our partners from IMF, from World Bank. They also agreed that at this particular moment, National Bank can be last resort for a government. We don't want to use it as a key tools to finance our deficit, but uh, as, it, as we see uh, some uh, liquidity problems in our treasury accounts, we come to National Bank of Ukraine and ask them to, to help us. But again, the key and most important things uh, which we try to base on is uh, our donors and the uh, idea to safeguard necessary amount of money on our from our key partners is our most important uh, goal in this particular moment. 90% of my time I'm spending on negotiations with different G7 ministers of finance, IMF, World Bank, uh, EBRD, EBAD, EAD. So it's, it's far different situation than it was before the war. 
On the G7 that you mentioned, we saw the commitment last week of $20 billion. But as you mentioned here, there's a gap between that commitment and the money actually coming into your account. So you referenced this in what you just said, but how close are you in terms of needing monetary financing, printing of money, and going to the central bank? How do you make that decision? And where's the threshold in your mind of when to make that request of the central bank? We agreed that we uh, can borrow from central bank the amount uh, uh, no bigger than 1.5 billion US dollars per month. So, and we make this limit and we moved in this direction despite all of those problems. We try to be reliable partners with National Bank of Ukraine because we see that uh, it could be not just their problem if we if we uh, created hyperinflation loop it could be a problem from the government if we find a way how to solve so now we see that uh, the money we, which we received from national bank of ukraine um, national bank of ukraine can uh, use to deposit certificates so they they can absorb this amount uh, and uh, this money uh, doesn't uh, pressure um, uh, consumption, so they just uh, uh, deposit it in the banking accounts and then transfer to the accounts of National Bank of Ukraine. But again, it, the situation can change very quickly in the period of three months. So when people realize that they can spend this money, uh, it's a question that uh, it's a question of time when this money can can do uh, inflation bigger and make uh, make us other problems which we should find how to solve. And the gap is enormous. Natalia said this in the beginning, an estimate $600 billion so far, economic losses. We saw President Zelensky yesterday in video in Davos calling for a new Marshall Plan, which he has said before. And I wonder if you could explain that to us a little. You know, when we think back of the Marshall Plan, it was, of course, loans and grants, but primarily grants, if you look at the proportion of it, not loans. So I wonder how you think about that as you're negotiating with, say, the IMF and conditionality. Is this something you are asking for from the international community that should be in the form of grants, or is it a mix of grants and loans? You know, uh, I am... What I want to tell you is that it's not my headache right now how we can find money to rebuild our economy. My headache right now how we can find money to just to be uh, alive in the poor conditions. That's why uh, I don't know how we can uh, find the right sources to for rebuilding. It's not uh, my key point which I uh, should have a close look because my idea is to find money right now for the three months period to the end of the year. And then if we find right condition, we can discuss what could be this condition for a government, what we should do, uh, what should be, because the idea of Marshall Plan for Ukraine is part different in different from different stakeholders. There are several stakeholders within Ukraine for discussing Marshall Plan. Uh, of, co of course, President Zelensky is, is leading this group of people. Uh, we see that the uh, European Commission provided uh, their views on how it Marshall Plan can look for Ukraine. Uh, also, we see that it's possible for the United States to be involved, Canada wants to be involved, United Kingdom wants to be involved. Again and again, a lot of people wants to support us. And my question as a Minister of Finance is very simple. What could be sources of this? Or it could be grand financing or great financing. It's a question of sources. If we can receive candidacy, uh, status of candidate uh, to the European Union, I, I believe we can find a source within European Union because it could be some way which we uh, can be uh, possible to use structural fund of EU, funds of EU. Now, it's one way. Another way, uh, how uh, we can seize 
Russian assets, which now frozen. It could be another another sources to finance our reconstruction needs, our Marshall Plan. But if you look at perspective to say this assets, it takes uh, some time to do this because it's not just political decision from some governments to do so. We see that Canada, United Kingdom, the United States are eager to support us in this endeavor and to help us uh, to use this frozen assets towards Ukraine, to rebuild Ukraine. But again, it takes a lot of time to to final point to receive this money. So uh, I am not just, um, uh, I'm not so uh, optimistic as other people uh, who believe that we should rebuild Ukraine as fast as we can. I uh, very pessimistic in this endeavor because we should win this war first and then we can start the process of rebuilding. But we can start process of discussion how to rebuild Ukraine. Conditionalities, we can start to understand what we should do within Ukraine, how to attract foreign direct investment within Ukraine. Because it's not just donors and credits money. I believe uh, that the only way to have another economy is to create necessary conditions which can attract foreign direct investment within Ukraine. And then we can understand that it could be some way on uh, judicial reform, anti-corruption reform, mm -hmm. and, then, and then and then. So the money and sources how to finance uh, Ukraine's uh, reconstruction, it's uh, not first maybe question which we should, should discuss. Because again, now we see that it's quite natural to finance our current needs and find the ways how to cover our deficit. And then after we will win this war, because I believe there is no other ways, we can discuss uh, sources how to finance the rebuilding of Ukraine. This is my answer. Th th no, thank you for that. So let me just ask you a blunt question and then I have one more and then I'm gonna turn to my colleagues. But based on what you said, and you're speaking you know, here to our audience in Washington around the world, are you getting enough immediate support, separate from the rebuilding as you outlined, are you getting enough immediate financial support from Washington, from the G7, from the international financial institutions, or can more be done? You know, we agreed on the amount of money which we needed, $5 billion per month. And now what we see is that uh, the United States uh, passed the legislation, which uh, and uh, President Joe Biden signed it, which uh, opens uh, uh, a way how Ukraine can receive 7.5 billion US dollar as grant financing. Uh, also, we received very uh, very clear signal from the. European Union that Ukraine can receive 9 billion euro as a macro financial assistance. It could be credit, but again, it's very, um, very, very nice credit for you, for Ukraine because it's, we, okay, we need to return, but uh, the question is very, uh, very low interest rate and uh, high uh, level of maturity. So, um, except of that, we see possible to receive additional finances from Japan. Japan agreed on us to add uh, 500 million US dollars more. We already received 100 million from Japan. Uh, again, it could be grant financing from Germany. Minister of Finance uh, of Germany, Christian Lindner, uh, gave, pledged they can provide us 1 billion euro as a grant financing from Germany. Uh, also, we believe in the trust fund of World Bank. Uh, they already have there more than 1.5 billion US dollars as a credit for Ukraine. Also, uh, uh, another instrument which we strongly believe it could possibly be part of uh, uh, sources to rebuild Ukraine. I want to stress it out. It's a SDR allocation mm -hmm. to help Ukraine 
and uh, we see that the IMF sends them uh, together with Canada Minister of Finance, Christian Freeland, a creative administrative account and uh, the part of SDRs, which other country can provide, Ukraine can be shared through this account. And uh, the, this can be, this money, the amount of this money can be very huge. Yes. And if we ask them just to share part of this money uh, reallocated in 2021, and uh, I think that uh, even 10% or 20%, Kristalina Georgieva in G7 meeting ministers of finance mentioned that they can share even 20% of this SDR towards Ukraine can help us. Yes. But again, it's a question of time. As I, as I uh, correctly, you should correctly ask me how, how much money we are receiving yet. Uh, I can tell you it's just around 6 billion US dollars for three months. So there's a gap. There's a gap that needs to be made up. Yeah. yeah. And no, it's an important reminder for us. We'll share here with the group what we've done on the special drawing rights of the IMF. And as we all know, that can take time and it, we have to cut through the red tape given the gap you've just outlined for us. One more question from me. You have a unique perspective on the Russian economy sitting where you sit. How do you assess the impact of the sanctions so far on the Russian economy? What more would you like to see done? We hear from the EU now the oil embargo may come into effect or be announced at least in the coming days. Okay, I am very straightforward person. I can tell you that uh, we see that despite all of the sanctions in Russia, which were imposed on Russia, the effect is, uh, I don't want to tell positive. It's very slightly negative. Because what we see right now is that Russia uh, receives every day 1 billion euro because of uh, a huge price on oil and gas. They have uh, deficit, profit in their budget, so they can spend much more money on their wartime war machine. They can uh, make it easier for them to do the war with Ukraine. Also, a lot of other uh, factors. Their uh, exchange rate. We expected everybody expected that uh, there will be a, should be a drop of ruble because of sanctions. Now it's not. Moreover, rub, ruble is uh, uh, is appreciated in comparison with uh, pre-war times. Even they even lifted some restrictions on uh, currency control. So. Okay, 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 we can estimate the, that they, they can do a great job to support the economy. But from me, Minister of Finance of Ukraine, which are suffering every day, in our territory, we see a lot of damages. We see they killed our people. They destroyed our critical infrastructure. They destroyed our economy. Our everyday losses is around 300 million euro per day. And when we see that the sanctions uh, haven't been working, we ask to do more because I think that it could be another another front of uh, a possible support to the support of Ukraine. We need more sanctions on, uh, you mentioned oil and gas embargo. Yes, it should be total oil and gas embargo, but because when we're just talking about this, it, it only uh, makes a uh, price on oil uh, stable and uh, raise raises prices just raises because of this buzzes about possibility of embargo but uh, when we see a embargo okay uh, it can make it damage for uh, russian economy another part of sanctions which can uh, help us uh, sanction all uh, uh, increase the list of bands which can be sanctions because now, now we see that uh, the only uh, uh, minor um, quantity of banks now under sanctions. So we believe that we can increase this amount. Another question that we uh, we can move towards secondary sanctions on other countries which can or could help Russia to avoid sanctions, to bypass sanctions. 
So again and again, uh, sanctions should be very uh, critically analyzed and uh, in a way how uh, they can uh, make Russia suffer. And of course, if you look at perspective, uh, sanctions can work and uh, can make Russia economy uh, some uh, damages, provide some damages for Russia economy. But uh, for this particular moment, uh, which time is very important for us, very important this time. We can't wait until the next year when we see how sanctions can make some problems for Russia Ministry of Economy or Ministry of Finance. We see that now they can do what they want. And it, it's another question which we are discussing with our international partners. We ask them to do more sanctions. So let me now turn to Melinda Herring, Deputy Director of the Eurasia Center. Melinda, over to you. Thanks so much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Minister. I have two questions for you on reconstruction. So the first question is that the Ukrainian government has set up a centralized reconstruction account. And I think a lot of us are wondering why you guys did that. Why should other governments trust Kiev to oversee this enormous task, given th that you have an ongoing war uh, and the, 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 the scope of the task and the country's, I'd say, lackluster uh, record with state corruption. So that's question one. And then uh, a more philosophical question for you. You and your government are going to face a lot of dilemmas in the reconstruction uh, work. Are you planning on rebuilding what was lost or are you planning on bringing things up to a higher standard? So for instance, on energy, will you just rebuild old uh, Soviet buildings to the old standard or will you bring them up to green energy standards? Thank you. It's a good question. Uh, you know, uh, I am not a person who is in charge of uh, reconstruction of this country, but uh, I really understand how the cost, the real cost of reconstruction and how it will cost. And uh, if uh, you ask me in 2021 uh, how we can manage to collect necessary amount for money for reconstruction. I, I, I have an idea how to answer your question because this money we collected from our taxes and uh, despite all of the problems you mentioned, despite, despite of the corruption and other questions which we uh, had despite all of the reforms, uh, it's still the, I think the major bottlenecks of Ukraine, that we are not uh, able to show that other country or other investors should trust us. Despite all of this, um, it was money of taxpayers of Ukrainian people. So, so we can manage to uh, make uh, expenses or uh, expenditures in a way how what what country needed to do it could be road construction it would be critical infrastructure rebuilding etc but now in 2022 it's uh, not the same because uh, we in a war period we are under martial law uh, so our budget uh, is very uh, compressed we just paying pensions salaries, other protections, uh, uh, expenses, and uh, was salaries for uh, our troops, for our army. And uh, it means that it's only minor amount of money we spend to, uh, to just to relieve or rebuild our critical infrastructure. From three months period, uh, we just spent not no much than 1.5 billion grivnas uh, on uh, some uh, constructions to to help uh, to create some uh, temporary bridges, uh, etc. And I think that your question is about future. And uh, again, if you if you discussing about future, you should realize 
what could be the sources to finance uh, rebuilding of Ukraine. And I think that if we rely on international partners and uh, some part of uh, donors financing this rebuilding, it should be uh, very uh, trustful and mutual agreement on how and in what ways we can spend this money. Because uh, I think that uh, it's not just uh, our taxpayers' money, it's taxpayers' money of uh, taxpayers of other countries. And these countries can ask us to create a very transparent mechanism on how we can should use it, in what ways, what goals. And when you're asking about uh, just uh, rebuild, rebuilding apartments in a Soviet manner, I don't think it's a wise idea to do so. Uh, we should um, uh, try to create new environment, uh, an energy efficient environment. We, now we're in a petrol crisis and we believe that it, it could be uh, prolonged uh, longer than we expected before. And now it's the question should we should uh, create enough space for uh, electromobiles, uh, uh, buildings within Ukraine. So it's a lot of question to discuss, but uh, what I want to, uh, what, what we want to make a stress on, what questions bother me the most, that we can rebuild our country when we see trust among partners. When we create enough space for trust, when we uh, provide necessary reforms, very crucial necessary reforms, judicial reforms, anti-corruption reform, uh, to, to get, get installed all necessary institutions to control uh, how we can spend this money. So it will be uh, the way which help us to prevent questions like that. Because, uh, I think it's uh, all people of Ukraine are interested in to just to close this book of 30 years book uh, of our uh, failed state endeavor. Because I can tell you that uh, we're struggling a lot and uh, uh, a lot of people now asking, why we believe you? Why we, 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 you are thinking that you will be not the same after the war? I think that the war gave us good chance to forget about our disease, which we have in, in the previous period of time. But again, chance, we, we, what we have is a chance, but the chance doesn't mean that uh, we will uh, use it. So let's uh, trade necessary conditions that we will use this chance. This is my answer on your question. Thank you. And I know we have just about 10 minutes left, so we want to get through a lot of questions we have from the audience. First, let me turn Charles Litchfield, Deputy Director at the Geoeconomic Center. Charles. Well, Ranku Minister, uh, I have a very quick question on uh, your relationship with the EU. Uh, I realize that you want to talk about the immediate future. Uh, and so instead of asking about long-term membership prospects, I was interested in whether you think the EU could do more to improve uh, Ukraine's access to EU markets so that the Ukrainian economy, which I understand is operating uh, at a very constrained level, um, could perhaps uh, do slightly better. Uh, are there negotiations going on with the EU on market access? Uh, and then uh, in the long term, uh, what would be your hope for um, the Ukraine's membership prospects? There's obviously the debate about um, being offered a sort of anti-chamber membership, membership um, by France, uh, that's been criticized in Washington uh, and in other parts of the EU. So I was wondering what your reaction was. Thank you. You know, we believe in our uh, Euro European perspective and uh, we, we are paying a very huge price for this perspective. Every day, uh, losses of our civilians and our army is uh, proved that our goal to be part of great Europe is not just uh, uh, 
desire. It's uh, our struggle to achieve it. And uh, that's why I, I am not uh, even uh, thinking that we can uh, some part, uh, this it could be a, some kind of dispute on that way. We expecting that other countries can uh, estimate our efforts because uh, again, we are talking about one of the biggest war in this part of the world after the Second World War. We, we are talking about that we are struggling uh, with the most powerful army in this continent. We are struggling for our independence. We are trying to, uh, to achieve all possible, uh, to do all necessary to win this war. And that's why if we, after the war, will uh, wait another 10 or 20 years to be part of uh, Europe, it, it takes a, a lot of, it gets a lot of questions within Ukraine. Uh, why, why it's so um, dishonest in context of uh, just, uh, just people of Ukraine, because civilians are, are not uh, understand uh, when some uh, politicians within Europe are talking of uh, uh, lasting perspective. If if there is some condition, let's let's make this condition uh, implemented within Ukraine, and uh, then we can. It's it's our struggle. We are struggling to be part of Europe. You also mentioned uh, about. Um, EU markets a possibility to get access to the market. Now we see that Europe uh, uh, lifted all uh, market uh, uh, quotas and uh, uh, duties which uh, were, uh, were related towards uh, commodities from Ukraine. So it's a one way how uh, they can support Ukraine's economy. Because uh, it's it could be uh, we believe that we can be a part of uh, single European markets and to be to be in a like a free free zone with Europe without any uh, customs and duties. So we, we are also it's a part of our struggle to be part of uh, European uh, market. So let's see how it will be. But again, <laughs> I, I don't expect it could be in 10 or 20 years. We can do our homework very quickly. Thank you. Thank you. Let me turn to Andrew from the Eurasia Center. Andrew, over to you. Thanks, Josh. Mr. Minister, very quickly for me, some experts are discussing um, ways to break Russia's Black Sea blockade. Um, I wonder just how much would this help the Ukrainian economy to be able to ship in the Black Sea? How much would this help the Ukrainian economy tomorrow if we can make this happen? You know that uh, our Odessa Harbor um, is the uh, most uh, um, important ways on uh, for Ukraine to export our commodities throughout the world. And now what we see right now is that uh, because of uh, unprovoked Russia aggression and uh, blockade of um, seaports of Ukraine, more than 10 million uh, crops are stuck there. And um, I already talked that it's, it's not just Ukrainian problem. It can be a problem from uh, North and South Africa, from Egypt, from other countries which rely on our crops. But again, the way is how to solve uh, this uh, bottleneck. Now they discuss, there are some discussion on the ways how we can solve this problem. And you know that uh, United Nations also 
are interested on the ways how to support Ukraine uh, to get uh, commodities delivered to the uh, to their customers. Let's see how it will be because now uh, well, what we see is still the same problem as it was in March. So and time is very important uh, also for this uh, endeavor because. Uh, we can expect in August, September, and October another another harvest, and uh, we, should, we should also find the ways how to stock it and how to deliver it. So um, I believe that the way on how how we should um, deblocate this uh, road should be found uh, sooner than later, because it's not just Okay, it's not just Ukrainian problem. It's, uh, I believe it's a problem for whole uh, hum mankind. Thank you. We have some great audience questions here and let me pull a couple of them together. One's on public debt. It may surprise people who aren't paying very close attention that Ukraine is in a punctual way, in a timely way, servicing and paying all of its public debt, paying its bondholders. But given the financing gap we discussed, I wonder if you could talk about how you weigh that decision. And if you think about debt relief, debt renegotiation with creditors at this time. It's a very sensitive question for us because uh, I, um, have strong idea in my mind that uh, you should be very strong and committed to fulfill all your obligations. Uh, it's my ministerial position and position of our ministries. And um, despite all of the issues we uh, have from beginning of the war, we very we were always very committed to do all necessary payments to repay and to service our debt payments. But again, um, we see a lot of incentives around the world. We are not uh, just uh, want to be silent and just uh, want to be earless. We understand that uh, other donors uh, are push us to do some steps on a way how to make uh, debt relief, debt restructurings. I'm not ready to uh, tell that uh, it's a, uh, that we are not uh, thinking about some ways, but we are not uh, making any steps to do this because uh, for this year, we have very uh, minor debt, uh, foreign debt uh, repayment. And uh, only big amount we see in uh, September not 900 million US dollars. So until September, we, we see it possible to do all necessary payments. And again, we are not, now we are trying to find the way how to, to make it possible to do payments even in September. Mm -hmm. so, uh, let's see how it will be because uh, for now in, uh, we're talking about this in, Mar in, in May, so we have uh, June, July, and August to, 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 to be ready to answer these questions. Because I, I should change my previous mood. So, uh, and uh, because there, there are a lot of uh, desire to, to help us, to make us debt relief program and other programs, we are not, we are not we are not seeking for this uh, debt relief program because we want to be a reliable partner. We want to be able to borrow in the international capital market. It's our key goal, a key understanding of how things are going on. So that's why if you are talking about any debt relief, debt restructuring, and something like that, let's uh, Ukraine find the ways how to talk about it because we don't want uh, somebody to do it behind us. Because it's all it's our own interest to be part of international capital markets. It's our own interest to be a uh, uh, very reliable partner because we used to be so. So that's why 
it's very complicated question to answer it very st strict directly yeah or yes or no yeah. so if we if we see it possible we will look at perspective now we are able to provide all necessary requirements I appreciate that. And I, you know, I would hope all the external creditors and anyone listening in on this or watching after, I imagine they would have to be understanding given the circumstances, even as you think about future financing in the Ukrainian economy. And it's extraordinary that the Russian economy may be about to default on its bonds, but the Ukrainian economy through your stewardship and the stewardship of the government may continue to pay its bonds, whatever the trade-offs involved in that. I think that's an extraordinary dynamic to think about in the months ahead. I have a question here about cryptocurrency that's been talked about a lot. Cryptocurrencies as a means of funneling in humanitarian aid, given all the frictions in the current system. What do you see on the ground? Is that actually happening? Are digital currencies, either in public or private form, being used to help the humanitarian crisis? I know that uh, one of my colleagues uh, Vice Prime Minister and Minister of Digital Transformation, Mikhail Fyodorov, uh, pushed this uh, idea on a way that different uh, donors can help Ukraine through cryptocurrency, and they created even uh, some part of fund or some um, some 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 way how to use it. So. But I am not ready uh, to tell that I am su fully supportive of this idea. I believe that uh, countries should deal directly with the countries, with international partners, because it's very transparent way to receive money. It's very transparent way uh, which we can report on how we can collect and how we can spend this money. We can uh, provide all necessary uh, analysis, analysis and reports on all sense of uh, grant finance, credit finance, which we received through budget. But cryptocurrency is um, another way. Of course, different people can use this um, to support Ukraine, to support humanitarian needs, to support even our military uh, conditions. But again, I am talking about here as a minister of finance of Ukraine. So. Uh, we can't use uh, cryptocurrency in our budget. So if somebody wants to support Ukraine through, through cryptocurrency, you, you, they can do it. But I am not responsible for that. I don't want to commit any responsibility for cryptocurrency, which uh, flowing to different accounts towards Ukraine. So I am responsible only for budget money for taxpayers' money and for donors' money. I Again, I can, can stress it. I can tell how we can spend every cent of uh, donor support money which we received from this moment of time. Thank you. Minister, you've been extraordinarily generous with your time, and we know how busy you are. I just want to give you the floor for any final comments you want to make to this audience going forward, something to leave us with, and then I'll wrap and conclude. Um, thank you very much for listening to me. Uh, I try to be uh, very honest with you and try to explain where are we are now and what our current needs, what our expectations about future, about rebuilding of our country. And again, I want to uh, make it clear that I believe that the only way which can help Ukraine to become uh, prosperous and stronger is uh, we should be different in comparison with pre-war time. We should create different institutions. We should create different environment. We should uh, find the ways how to convince other countries and other businesses to be, to believe in Ukraine, to trust us. So, and uh, I think that uh, even during the war, we should uh, talk about our uh, Marshall Plan, thinking about ways how to convince private money invest in Ukraine. When we realize that foreign direct investment investors are seeking for to invest in Ukraine because because of 
there was some reasoning for that because they can believe in Ukraine. It could be a right signal that uh, we are moving in the right directions, that we have our own Marshall Plan, that we can attract as much money as needed to rebuild our country. So thank you very much, all listeners. Thank you very much again. Um, I was happy to answer your question. So thank you for your honesty and your time and dealing with all the range of questions on behalf of the Geoeconomic Center and the Eurasia Center. We are honored to host you today. Your government and the Ukrainian people have inspired all of us. We want to continue to support in the ways we can, both financially and otherwise, and both in the immediate crisis, as you outlined, winning the war, and then the rebuilding effort. We will be here. Thank you, and thank you, everyone, for being with us. Have a good rest of the day. Thank you.